publicly recorded, uh, I will be sending this link uh, when we're done along to um, all teachers and registrants of this program. So don't worry, you'll have this here um, at a later time. So we are, as I said, I'm thrilled to be welcoming um, Sarah and uh, Margaret here today. Let me just go back one slide to show you why they're here. Uh, the museum just today opened our special exhibit from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum called State of Deception, The Power of Nazi Propaganda. And that is what Sarah and Margaret will be sharing with you all here uh, through the rest of the program. I'm sure you don't want to hear me continue to talk. We want to hear our, from our special guests. But um, you'll see the room is going to transition a little bit. We're going to put on our webcam here in just one second. But um, I want to point out to all of you um, the white box underneath the gray one that says Q&A. Uh, that is where you will be typing in questions throughout the entire program. Uh, this is Chrissy on camera, but I will be moderating those questions and looking into them. And uh, choosing, I'm sure we'll get a lot, so I'm going to choose uh, the best and the, as many as I can to get through in the time that we have uh, here today. And um, when the time comes, uh, Margaret and Sarah will be answering your questions. So please type them in there. I will be looking into them. So without further ado, I'm going to start our webcam up so everybody can see uh, you all. All right. There we go. So uh, now you can see Margaret and Sarah. And I guess since I'm off camera, would you mind reintroducing yourselves to the audience? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Campbell. I'm a program coordinator with leadership programs at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And I am <coughs> Margaret Meissner, and I am a volunteer at the Holocaust Museum, and I am a Holocaust survivor. Fantastic. Well, do you all want to share a little bit about the special exhibit? And then, um, Margaret, it would be great if you could share your story after that. Sure. Thanks, Chrissy. So thank you all so much for joining us. We're really honored to be here at the museum. Uh, I'm, we're here because of the opening, as she said, of the State of Deception exhibition. State of Deception was opened for, at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington in 2009. And at the time, it was the most popular exhibition that we've ever opened. And since then, it's gone on a national tour. In addition to being open here in New Orleans, it's also now being shown a temporary version at the UN, uh, the United Nations in New York, and Paris City Hall. So today is also what's known as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. So we are at the museum in DC and all of these other institutions, along with this exhibition, doing um, some commemoration around this exhibition for International Holocaust Remembrance Day. We also are actively engaged in trying to um, help students and the public understand what is propaganda, how they can identify it, and um, understanding that it's not just a thing of the past, but also very much a thing of the present. So to help us kind of talk about propaganda today, Margaret's here to share her story, and I have some questions for her, and you have some questions for her, but I'm going to turn it over to Margaret. So Margaret. Well, thank you so much, and I'm really thrilled that all of you are watching from all over the United States. And isn't it amazing technology that makes it possible? In, in my early childhood, this would have never, ever occurred. So I'll tell you that I was born in Austria 95 years ago, but I lived there only a very short time because my family moved to Prague, Czechoslovakia. And I was the youngest of four children. I have three older brothers, and they considered me a little toy. So I didn't like that, <clears throat> excuse me. I did not want to be a little toy, nor did I want to be a girl, because I thought it was, it was much better to be a boy. Now I have to tell you that at this point, I don't mind being the youngest, nor do I mind being a woman. <laughs> uh, so I grew up in a very assimilated, quite well-to-do family. And my job was to learn. I was a perpetual student then, and I continue to be a perpetual student. And I'm just thrilled that I am in this beautiful World War II museum, which I didn't even know existed. So for me, this is a great privilege. So to come back to my childhood, my mother had the idea that her children had to speak four languages by age 16. So we all spoke German at home and Czech in the street 
And then we had um, an English nanny and a French nanny. So we learned four languages. And I was a very good student, but not a very interested student. When I became a teenager, as you can imagine, I was only interested in boys. But that they didn't work out very well because sometimes the boys I was interested in were not interested in me. So when Hitler annexed Austria in 1938, I was 16 years old. And my mother didn't think that it was safe for me to stay in Czechoslovakia, although Czechoslovakia was a democratic government that I knew protected its citizens. But still, my mother thought I should leave. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so she decided that the best place for me to be safe would be France. And she found a French family that would take me in as a sort of paying guest. And she shipped me off to Paris uh, by myself. And to me, this was a great, uh, great adventure because I didn't leave much of anything behind. I left some friends behind, but I was so sure I was going to see everybody again in a short time because I had no idea what the future would hold for us. And I think I was not the only one who didn't know because you have to understand that at that time in the world, there were no media. So for all of you, this is, I, I presume you cannot imagine that one could live without a television, without a computer, without a cell phone. None of this existed. So we had newspapers and we had some <clears throat> posters, such as the ones that are being exhibit in the, exhibited in the, in the propaganda exhibit here in the museum. And we had the radio. Now, the radio was a brand new thing that had not existed before. And the Nazis took very, made very good use of the radio <clears throat> because they gave a radio to every German family. And the only channel that one could play was the government channel was full of propaganda. And everybody so sat in, in a circle around the radio because this was the only thing that talked to you in your home. And the more they listened to propaganda, the more they believed it. So propaganda was a very, very important method whereby Hitler uh, tried to convince the German people that if all of Germany's woes and all the problems that Germany had were due to the Jews. The Nazis believed that the Jews had stabbed them in the back at the end of World War I in 1919, and that they had to fight the Jews so that they would not continue, uh, continue uh, hurting the German public. Now, Many German people did not know any Jews because less than 1% of the population was Jewish. But the propaganda was very effective and many people started believing it. And even if they didn't believe it, they just thought, well, the Nazi government should do whatever it wanted. And it comes to one of the issues that is very important to me. I'm going to drink something if you don't mind. Excuse me. It meant that <clears throat> the German public stood by while the Nazi was preparing for, for war. And this is something which is very important to me because I think that maybe World War II could have been avoided if the Western countries had not stood by and letting Hitler do whatever he wanted because they didn't really take it seriously. So how did that affect me? So when Austria was annexed in, in 1938, 
1938, my mother sent me to Paris. I lived in a French family that was very nice to me, but the French police was not nice at all. They thought that I was a, a, a nuisance. Why did I come there? Why didn't I stay at home? They didn't want any foreigners. And I felt very uncomfortable in a country that really didn't want me, although my personal experiences were very good. So, and I was learning dressmaking. Now, why was I learning dressmaking? Because I needed to have a profession with which I could make a living that was not based on languages because I didn't know where we might end up. So, and you have to understand that in 1938, if you wanted to buy a dress, you didn't go to the department store. That didn't exist. So you went to the dressmaker. So dressmaking was a respected profession. And I was a fairly good student, although I was not careful enough as my teachers reminded me very frequently because I was not very patient. And I am more impatient than ever, I have to tell you. I'm not good at waiting. So, uh, so the, that was in, in 1939, then all of Czechoslovakia, after the Austrian annexation in 1938, in March of 1939, um, all of Czechoslovakia was annexed. And at that point, my mother came to join me in Paris. But she left in such a hurry to be able to get out of Czechoslovakia quickly that the only thing she was able to bring out of all our assets was a little small suitcase. So overnight, we became paupers. Until then, mother had been able to send me a monthly sum with which I could carry, with which I could cover my expenses. But now we had no more money and we were really dependent on, on handouts from others. And we kept watching what was going on in the war. So in, in uh, March of 1939, the Germans invaded Poland and that started World War II because Germany, because uh, France and Great Britain declared war on Germany. And so now all of a sudden, because I was an Austrian citizen and Austria was part of Germany, so I became an enemy alien. Suddenly I was really an enemy because I was considered the German. And the police became even more aggressive and more uncomfortable, and more 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 unfriendly, and I became more uncomfortable. And of course, I was watching the propaganda that that existed in France, because the French tried to reassure its public that they had nothing to worry about, that Germany was never going to defeat France, because France had built the Maginot Line, the the fortress between, at the border between France and Germany. And they did not understand that the fortress was not good enough because when the Germans came in, they circumvented the, the fortress and were, came into France through Holland and Belgium. And there we were at war in, in France and still watching German propaganda. For example, there, were, there was a big poster all over Paris which had the whole world in red and then Germany was a little spot that was marked in black and white and it said, how can they win us if they are so insignificant in the world? Well, that was obviously propaganda which was not well conceived. So while we were watching this and wondering what was going to happen to us, since we were in a country where we were not welcome and the war was approaching, so we tried to find ways of leaving, but nobody in the world was interested in giving us asylum. 
And that was a terrible thing for millions of people like me, because during the 1930s, there was depression in the world, and no country was really interested in accepting penniless refugees, including the United States. So while this was going on, and the, world, the war was coming closer, one day my mother received notification that she was going to be uh, de deported. They didn't call it deported. They said that she would be uh, what was the evacuated. evacuated. Thank you. Yeah. She would be evacuated, and so she was told come to the police station in a neighboring town with three days worth of food, whatever you could carry on your back and three blankets. And I took her to the police station. And when I came, I said, why are you taking her? And they said, none of your business. And where are you taking her? Go home. We are not answering questions. So here I, I was all by myself. My mother was leaving, and the Germans were approaching. So it was a very scary moment. But the last minute before mother entered that bus, she she took out of her pocket a sum of money, some uh, se several thousand francs, and gave them to me and said, now it's up to you to get us out of here. Whatever that meant, I have never been able to find out. But it occurred to me that that meant that I had to see whether I can find her and liberate her wherever she was, and that I had to get both of us out of this impossible situation. So while I was debating this, the Germans came closer and closer, and there was this tremendous exodus out of France, where people were just streaming in a certain uh, direction to the south, and one could not go walk in the street because there were these tremendous crowds. Now, I, because I had been at the police every other week, I went to, and they told me that I was never going to be able to leave without permission. So I decided to go to the police station to see whether I, they would let me leave so that I could find my mom. And when I came to the police station, the police station was open, but the policemen had gone. They had joined the crowds that were leaving. So I thought now I had an alibi so that I could leave without permission. And when I looked at this tremendously chaotic crowd, I got so frightened that I thought I couldn't possibly join the walk. And then I remembered that mother had given me some money. So I took the money and decided to buy a bicycle. And I must have found the last bicycle that was available in Paris. It was a men's racing bike with these, with these curved um, handles. And I bought that bike, and on that bike I left Paris. And I had with me um, a little case in which I had my dressmaking notes. I had two chocolate croissants and my and a, a set of oil paints because I thought if I was going to become a dressmaker or dress designer, I also needed to be able to to design fashion. So that was the idea with which I left. And I was very frightened, but then it turned out that I had an advantage over most of the other people because with a bicycle, I could get around all the st stalled cars and the crowds of people who were inching ahead of me. So I have a long story about this escape, about which I wrote a book, if any of you are interested. It is called Margaret's Story, and it is available on Amazon. But because we don't have time for me to tell you that the escape in detail, I will just tell you that quite by accident I found my mother. It was really a miracle that I found her. And she was in a French concentration camp on the border of France and uh, France and Spain, 
so that I now had a direction where to go. And when I eventually found a train, I left my bike and I found a train. And when the train stopped, by miracle, I was about 20 kilometers from the camp of girls where she was. So when the war was over and it ended very chaotically because the French government gave up but didn't have another government, so there was there were a few days of great chaos. So she was able to leave the concentration camp and join me. And together we escaped further to what then became the unoccupied part of France on the Mediterranean to the city of Marseille. And in Marseille, there were lots of other, for, uh, other uh, refugees, also from Czechoslovakia, from Austria, who were all trying to find visas to leave France and, and, and save themselves from the war. Now, I was able to secure a Spanish and a Portuguese um, transit visa. Transit meaning that just walk, driving through, not staying there. But the French would not give us exit permits. They said, you cannot leave unless we give you permission. And the French would not give us permission. So on the day before our visas expired, Mother and I decided we would go to the French-Spanish border and see whether we might be able to get through without permission. So we arrived, and really this trip was very scary because we were constantly avoid, avoid, avoiding the police that were controlling the, the access to the border. But and we, this is in the mountains, right? Yeah, this, this is, is in the middle of the Pyrenees Mountains. Well, so it's on the are, border of yeah. the Pyrenees Mountains. So you're cr trying to cross a mountain, basically. Well, yes, but yeah. of course we we were still trying to cross to get over it to yeah. to to get permission to cross on the railroad because we didn't. So I, in desperation, because it was the last day of the validity of the visa, I approached a a a, a, a porter in the railroad station and explained our situation to him and. He said, well, maybe I can help you. I can show you how you can walk across the border, which was in the mountains up on the French side and down on the Spanish side. And he said, but be careful, because if the Spanish police catches you, they are going to catch you because you are crossing the border at an unauthorized place. So I said, well, if you give us directions, we won't get lost. But we did get lost. And the Spanish police caught us, and we went to a Spanish jail. Well, that was a most incredible experience, because I was a very proper young lady, and I thought I was never going to go to jail. And so when we found ourselves in this fascist jail, because Spain had just gone through an through a, a revolution and the fascist government won. So it was a very scary moment in which I learned a lot about the world because there were prostitutes there and I never thought in my life I would meet a prostitute, you can imagine. But the prostitutes were the ones who really helped us in jail because we didn't have a bowl into which they would give us our food, and we didn't have anything with us that most of the other prisoners had. So if the prostitutes had not helped us, we might not have been able to survive. And so that was such a meaningful experience for me that I had to rethink what my worldview was and what I was thinking, and I became really I started to become a different person, a person who was aware of the world and aware of my position in it and also aware of the role that the individual could play. So to make this, to end this 
this report, I have to tell you that we got out of jail with the help of very lovely friends and we were able to get to Portugal where we were where we were staying wondering what was going to happen next because of course we did not really have permission to remain in Portugal we only had permission to drive through Portugal but we were able to stay there and I became uh, I became a successful dressmaker because many of the other refugees had also lost all their belongings like we and I became the dressmaker to the refugees and my mother became my helper so that was a good thing to do but the situation was very dicey because we didn't know what would happen next so quite miraculously we got an affidavit of support which enabled us to get an American immigration visa so here now we were ready to go to the United States, but there was no shipping because the war was on and there were U-boats in the Atlantic Ocean. So eventually we were able to get passage on a Portuguese cork freighter that brought cork for wine bottles to the United States. And it hovered across the Atlantic Ocean for three weeks during which I was primarily seasick. But if I was not seasick, I played ping pong with the crew. So I learned a lot of Portuguese while I was talking to the sailors, and I also learned a lot of ping pong. So I've become a very good ping pong player. So I came to the, to the United States in, 19, in uh, April of 1941, I was 19 years old and I landed in the Chesapeake Bay. I did not see the stat Statue of Liberty because that was not how I came to the United States. And from then on, I have lived here very in, with great pleasure of being an American and with living in a country that has been wonderful to me. So that's my story. Before we take questions, I want to have you just briefly talk about what you did during the war and then after the war back in Germany oh, yeah. with propaganda. How did that, how did propaganda play a part after the war? So propaganda played a big part during the war because I worked in the American, uh, what? The Office of the War. The Office of War Information. I always forget that name. <laughs> in the Office of War Information. And the reason why I got the job there was because I spoke Czech and Portuguese. That was very unusual. Most people either spoke Slavic languages or Latin languages, but not the mix. So I worked in the Office of, of War, Information. War Information, and I was a producer of propaganda because I helped create the information that United States was sending out to the world and I felt very good about that because I knew how important propaganda was in in winning the war and how important it was for the United States to explain itself to the world that knew relatively little about America and then uh, and it's a good reminder that propaganda can be positive, right? That right. it can have a good message. Right. right. And then after the war, I had gotten married and my husband was discharged from the army and was went to Nuremberg to the war crimes trials uh, where he was uh, where he was employed by the American section of the court and I went along as a spouse but I was very unhappy in Germany because Germany was totally destroyed and I felt that uh, I was an American but I could have been on the other side easily so it was a difficult psychologically very difficult moment for me but it was saved by my applying for work at the Army of Occupation and they decided I was maybe a good con 
a good candidate for a job to re-educate the German youth. So I, I was in charge of German youth activities for the American military government in the Nuremberg region. And that was a really interesting job. It was not actually uh, developing propaganda, but I tried to explain to people what a democratic country looked like and what education in the United States looked like, which was so different from what the German, what the German public was, was used to. So that uh, propaganda was an important part of my life in, in Germany. And then when I, for many, many years, didn't think of propaganda because I worked in a local school system on the integration of handicapped children into the general education program. But when I retired from this job and I started working for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as a, as a volunteer, and the museum started this propaganda exhibit, which has now just opened in, in New Orleans, I became very much involved in propaganda again. So propaganda really has sort of uh, followed me through my adult life. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. Thank yes, you so thank much. You. So we do have some questions yeah. that we're going to answer. Um, the first one I'm going to uh, answer is just what does the word, what does the Holocaust mean? So the word Holocaust is actually comes from a Greek word. And it means literally uh, sort of a, a burnt offering or a burnt clearing. The definition that we now think of today as the Holocaust is the state-sponsored, systematic, perse bureaucratic persecution and murder of European Jews by Nazi Germany and its collaborators between 1933 and 1945. And so that's sort of a really broad definition, some of the big important things in there or is that it's not just Nazi Germany alone, the collaborators are, of other countries are included, um, that it is state-sponsored, though it was sort of the, the um, policy of Nazi Germany, and that it was systematic and bureaucratic. It had this sort of backing and this apparatus behind it. So that's really the definition of the Holocaust that we use. So that's just to help everyone understand. I have some questions for you, Margaret, from, from the group. So the first one, and thank you, Tia, for that question about the um, the definition of the Holocaust. Uh, TM wanted to know, what happened to your older brothers? Well, so my older brothers had, uh, were all able to save themselves, but in different parts of the world. My oldest brother was able to find asylum in Australia. My second brother found asylum in Canada. My third brother in Spain, and here I am in the United States. So we are we are all we have families all over the globe and for many many years we didn't see each other because first there was the war and then we were too poor to travel but we all got settled and then we started meeting again and now every three years we have a family reunion and by now the whole family has grown to 54 members so we are very fortunate because Hitler was trying to eradicate the Jews and we survived and we multiplied. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, and Mr. Locke's <laughs> class wanted to know, how many languages can you speak? You said you spoke four and then you added Portuguese. How many languages do you speak? Well, so I started out with German. My second language was, was Czech. My third language was French. My fourth language was English. My next language was Portuguese. My next, so that was five. That's five, five yeah. Five. <laughs> then my next language was Hungarian. Hungarian. Then I started to learn Russian. Russian. And then I learned Spanish. Spanish. And now I have learned some Italian. So wow. we're up to nine. nine. Oh Nine languages, goodness. but <laughs> I only I only really speak well English. I think that's, that's my best language. You do wonderful, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And uh, there was a question about the radio. So you did you have a radio at home as well? Well, we had we had a very special occasion with this radio. So although we were a well-to-do family, we not, did not have the kind of radio that the Germans gave gave to the German families. We only had a little crystal set that my mother used to listen to. And I was when Hitler came to power, I was ten years old. And my mother was messing with this little crystal set because there was a big speech that she needed to listen to. And it was very important to her. And I must have made some kind of noise that annoyed her. And she yelled at me and she said, shut up, Margaret. Now, my mother never said shut up to me. So five minutes later, after she had listened to what she wanted to listen, she came to me and apologized and said, I'm very sorry that I yelled at you, but there's a man in Germany by the name of Adolf Hitler, and he persecutes Jews, and we are Jewish, and I have to find out what he's saying so that I can protect you. And that five-minute interlude really started my awareness of the world around me. I was 10 years old and at, at, my, at my, I guess, educational level, I began to listen to news and read the newspaper and become aware of what goes on in the world. And that has remained with me to this day. And that's really important because you were in Czechoslovakia. You said in Germany, the radio, they could only hear sort of one station, yeah. one message. But, but in other countries... But in Czechoslov the radio that we had was such poor quality that one wasn't able to listen to anything. anything. <laughs> but even in the United States and other countries, they could hear what was going on right. in Germany. Right. But in Germany, they could only hear Correct. their own thing. Correct. Yeah. Okay. The next question from the Richardson Homeschool was, were you ever scared? Yes, I was plenty scared many times. First of all, I was always scared when I went to the police. In the beginning, when I was in Paris, I had to go to the police every other week. And I was always scared there because they were so aggressive. And they kept telling me that why was I there. So I was scared. And I was there. And they told you if you didn't check in, they would find you in a arrest you, right, right? Yes. yeah so that's that, that that was probably scary too yeah, yeah that was scary and then i was very scared when my mother left and then when i sort of looked at the opportunities i didn't i didn't come up with a bicycle right away i tried to go to the railroad station and the railroad was closed and there was a big sign there no more trains until the end of hostilities. And I didn't know what this meant. You know when that was going and to be. And then I, I was there all by myself because most of my friends were Czechs. They were not Austrians. They were Czechs. And the Czechs were not enemy aliens in France. So I really didn't have any other contacts. So and when I, when I started riding the bicycle, I was very scared. So there were many scary moments. And the moment when the, the Spanish police took us to the jail, it was in the middle of the night in a dark street and I had no idea where we were going. And there was this big building in front of us that turned out to be a prison. And when they opened the door to the prison, I thought the end of the world had arrived. Yeah, that sounds very scary. So uh, Miss Jackson's class asked, when you were reunited with your mom, what was her reaction? What did she... You said it was sort of by accident or kind of a miracle. Well, uh, it was really a, quite, a, <coughs> quite an occasion. So I was in this small town, Salis de Bern, which was, as I said, 20, 20 kilometers from Gurs. And the lady at whose house I was staying, which was a acquaintance who was very good to me she decided to go to the as soon as I arrived she went to the camp of girls to see whether she could find my mother and tell her that her child was saved because she knew that Paris had just fallen but she came to the camp and couldn't find my mother and left a message there 
and came back to me and said, look, I was in Bios, it was chaotic, I couldn't find your mother, I left a message, but don't count on it, that she will have never gotten it. And so I was sitting there waiting, not quite to do what to do next, and the government was just changing and nobody knew what was going on. And I was sitting in the yard and suddenly I saw a woman from far away approaching me, waving at me. And I didn't wave back because I didn't know anybody who could wave at yeah, me. Yeah, who could it be? Right? Who could it be? So this person came closer and closer and, I st and she waved more energetically and I still didn't wave back. And when she came close, I realized it was my mom. That's amazing. And I had not recognized her because she had lost a lot of weight. And she was very dark in her face because she had spent most of her time outdoors. And so I didn't come to welcome her or to embrace her. And the only thing she ever said about her stay in the concentration camp was here she found her child and I wasn't even welcome. <laughs> so that was a great disappointment to her. Yeah. So that she has never forgotten that because yeah. she never wanted to talk about her experience there. The only thing that she used to say about that was when I had children and my children were small and they made, they, they were fussy eaters and they didn't want to eat what was on their plates. She used to say that to them, you should have been in girls, you would have eaten anything that was put in front of you. Oh, wow, that was, <laughs> that, that, was <laughs> yeah, that was 30 years later. Yeah, right. um, do you know how long you were in the Spanish jail for? About how long? About a couple of weeks. Couple of weeks, okay. Long enough yeah. to have a skin rash because, of course, the sanitary condition were oh, unbelievable. And what about after? So this is Mr. Locke's class. They had two questions. First, did you ever have uh, bad dreams about the about your experience? Did you have nightmares? I sometimes still have bad dreams. Still, still do. Yeah. And you know what I really dream about? What do you dream about? Um, I keep thinking of what it would have been like to have been in a concentration camp and be forced to do things which I physically could not could not mm -hmm. tolerate and what would I have done? Yeah. So I think of this in my exercise class when I am doing things which are very hard and I force myself to continue doing it because I think if I had been in a concentration camp I would have had to continue. No matter now, what. Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably a crazy dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question from Mr. Locke's class was what about your friends in Paris? Were they, were they also Jews or were they non-Jews? My friends were not Jewish. And how did they react then when all of this well, was happening? They did were, they turn they were, against you? Or? They, no, they, they certainly did not, did not uh, agree with the Nazi propaganda. And they were, they were trying to protect. They had Jewish friends whom they were trying to protect. That's that good. They tried to be as, uh, as welcoming and as helpful as possible. And some of my friends then became part of the French underground. So, so the resistance. So to the resistance, yes. But the, officially, the French police and the French government were very uh, were eager to show how they supported Hitler. Mm -hmm. Because the French then believed that Germany was going to win the war. And so they might as well be on on good terms with this new government, and they were eager to show that they would support whatever the Germans wanted to support. So just a few more questions. Uh, from the Mellon Middle School, did you face anti-Semitism when you came to the U.S.? Did you experience any of that? Well, I personally did not experience any, but I remember maybe a year or two after I came, I tried to go to a resort in New Hampshire, and that was restricted, which meant that they did not want any Jewish guests. So that was very, uh, very disappointing, because I thought 
there was no anti-Semitism in the United States, but I was very wrong at the time because there was quite a bit of anti-Semitism. And unfortunately, there still is some because we hear it, that especially lately we've seen all kinds of anti-Semitic uh, actions all, all across the country. So anti-Semitism is, is not dead. And even in Europe, where there are no Jews, mm -hmm. countries are still very anti-Semitic. Yes. So I am a firm believer that one has to fight these injustices and that individuals should not just stand by when they see injustice or, or prejudice or bullying in their neighborhoods. They just can't say it's none of my business and walk away. You have to take on the fight and see how you can mend the fences. That's good. Okay, so and Lee wants to know, uh, how many children and grandchildren do you have? I have two children and two granddaughters. And I have a daughter who lives close to me in Silver Spring, Maryland, where I live in Bethesda, Maryland. And I have a son who lives in New York, who is working for a large hospital in, uh, at first he worked in HIV AIDS programs and then in palliative care for people who need to um, minimize pain. And now he works on medical research. And my two granddaughters are lovely young women. My older granddaughter is 27 and she's a PhD candidate at Northwestern University where she is studying public policy and and uh, and uh, the younger one the and the law oh, no. and my and, and and my younger one works in an organization called Big Brothers Big Sisters and she this is an organization that works with with teenagers pro that have problems in the world and matches them with volunteers and she does this matching. So she, they both work in really, um, uh, what this is, in, in uh, civil rights organizations. That's great. Okay, two more questions. I'm going to save um, uh, more contemporary questions for the end, but so, just from MK wanted to know, just how did you cope with everything as it was happening? How did you, how did you deal with it? How did you cope? I have never really thought about this because <laughs> I just had to put one, front, one foot in front of the other. And every day brought in new issues and I had to deal with them. So, but I thought that I really did, didn't lose uh, uh, didn't lose uh, optimism. I remember the most uh, the, the most negative moment was when the, the Spanish police captured us. I thought that was really the end of the world. but it wasn't because they took us they took us not in handcuffs but they were holding us and took us on a train and then took us to jail. So we survived the jail. So the more, um, the more difficult moments you survive, the more strength you gain. That's true. And so, and I was a risk taker. I took immense risks and they turned out well. And I keep taking risks in my life. <laughs> and what I would like to say to the young people, that don't be afraid of risks. Most people are afraid of failure. That's why they don't take any risks. So I think don't be afraid of failure. Try whatever you want to try. And if it doesn't work out, well, you will have learned something and you start something new. Or you'll fix what went wrong. So I believe that you should take risks in life and try new situations and not be afraid of not being able to manage. That's good. That's good advice. Yeah. Okay, so the last question from Elizabeth is about today. And Elizabeth wants to know, you were a refugee, right? So you were fleeing your home and you were leaving. So from your experience as a refugee, what can you tell us about how we can help 
today in the world. With we see refugees on the news all all the time. What's your thoughts about that? Well, there is all kinds of things we can do. Many of them are beyond our power because we cannot really interfere in our government's actions. Although I believe we can be important parts of what our government does. So I am a great letter writer. I wrote numbers of letters to my presidents and to my senators and representatives, and I always say what I think, because I think, how should they know what I think if I don't tell them? Yes. So that's one thing. I'm also very aware of what goes on at the local level in my community. And there are lots of things that go on at the state level that you can influence. So I believe that's an important thing, of, that's an important part of who I am, that I'm really aware of what goes on. And it is more difficult than it's ever been because with social media, you have hundreds, thousands of people who give, provide information and who knows what they what they really have in mind when they put when they put out these messages so you have to be more careful to listen more careful to understand who is saying what and evaluate what you're hearing and not just accept it because there's also lots of untruth that goes on in the world and it's up to you to figure out what you can believe and what you can't believe. And I think one has to listen to all sides in a dispute so that you can take a rational position. That's wonderful. That, I, I, man, that's the perfect way to end this program today. Um, all of you out there, let's give a virtual round of applause to Sarah and Margaret. I know you can't see them. and. I hear them, but I'm sure they're appreciative of everything. So maybe give one last wave out to the crowd. Say thank you thank all you. so much for joining us, and thank you, Sarah and Margaret, for everything that you've done for us today and and this wonderful last couple of days here at the museum. Just as a um, to close out, everybody, we're gonna just uh, move this, and you're gonna see a lot of resources now pop up on your screen. Let me actually start at the beginning here. Um, first off, if we have some, you know, sometimes we have some local audiences and regional audiences watching with us, please come see uh, State of Deception, The Power of Nazi Propaganda here at the National World War II Museum. It's a powerful um, and moving exhibit um, and, you know, uh, makes you just think and question, uh, and, which is exactly what you, you know, want to do, and especially looking at propaganda then and um, even connecting it to today. Uh, so that is great, and we hope you come see it and see it at the other locations even uh, that Sarah mentioned, if you're able. Um, there are a lot of great resources that are part of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's um, website, and of course at the museum too. Their main um, area where they discuss propaganda on their website is there at that link. And don't worry, you'll see this again. This is a rotating slideshow, so if you miss it here. Um, Margaret mentioned her story. If you are really interested in her story and want to learn more, you can purchase her book, Margaret's Story, and it's on Amazon, and that link will also take you to the Amazon page. And then lastly, I want to share, we've got um, our next webinar coming up is with author Steve Shankin of uh, the, um, the book Bomb, which is a Newbery Honor Book and a National Book Award finalist. Um, it is about, of course, the atomic bomb, it says, so the race to build and steal the world's most dangerous weapon. He will be joining us in, um, in March, and it should be a really great and interesting pro program with a lot of uh, great STEM connections for you teachers out there. Um, while you're uh, sitting here and listening and looking at everything, there are a couple poll questions below as well. Um, why does propaganda matter today? And how can we guard against propaganda? I think Margaret brought up some really wonderful lessons here that um, are relevant to our lives and important to our lives today. And so we kind of want to hear from you. And, um, how you evaluate propaganda and how you see it today. Um, and then lastly, on maybe the left-hand side of the slideshow there, you should see a few more links uh, that uh, can bring you to some more interesting stuff from the National World War II Museum and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I think that's it for me, and I think that's it for Sarah and Margaret here. So we just want to say a big thank you to the audience out there, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.